Good morning, and we're back with some more on COVID-19 360. My name is Bella Mundi, and I'm doing this with Anita. Yes, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, and you? I'm good, thank you very much. You should tell me this story about the face mask. Exactly. Well, you're welcome to COVID-19 360. <laughs> Just before we came on air, I was telling Bella of uh, some young people who are trying to make money out of this whole wear your mask initiative. Well, I think it's good with uh, the president saying we should wear more masks, you know, in order to protect ourselves as well. But in a situation where we don't have a lot of masks in the system, some people are trying to produce, you know, more masks in town. But the way and manner in which it's being made, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. And how it's even being sold as well is a problem. So yesterday, on my way home, uh, you know, the 37, just as you're turning to Burma camp, I saw, you know, a couple of, I saw like three people, and they've made a mask in like Kente, you know, the Kente, mm -hmm. fake Kente fabric. Mm -hmm. And even if it were in a rubber packaged nicely, I would have said, okay, cool. Yeah. But they're holding it like the way they sell the racks, you know. One, oh. you know, couple here, couple there, and just like that in traffic. And there is, you know. Oh my God. Would you buy a face mask in traffic? That's the question. No. And even if you did, no, but unfortunately, there are people who'd buy. Did you find out how much they were going for, by the way? I, I couldn't even roll down and say I'm asking because one, most of the hawkers don't have any form of protective equipment. So they no are mask, selling the mask, but they're but not, they are not wearing, wearing the mask. No gloves and they keep, you know, moving against each other. You know, when in traffic, they're selling, exactly. they keep going up and down. And that is my worry because when the lockdown was, you know, active effect, and yeah. was in effect, you didn't see them. And I was like, okay, it means that they been they not being there was quite good but unfortunately for them also you know their sources second, of yeah. livelihood was cut short but i have a problem with the way social distancing is just hmm. being thrown away hmm. they are not adhering to it graphic sellers ataji you know everything they're just yeah like I that know. you know in traffic and it's, it's quite worrying if one person should get it it was just spread. Now, this morning from the Western region, our correspondent was speaking to a few people in the market. And there was one woman who said that, oh, Nasa Corona na Conti. I think that, that, that is a problem as well. This yeah. morning, I had a conversation with another lady and she says it's more or less like a lot of people in other regions are thinking that because the lo uh, lockdown has been lifted, yeah. they are thinking that, oh, aku fadu aya die, to say the coronavirus ne ko. Yeah. That is what they are thinking. And I, I think... That's the belief. And, and it's totally wrong. That's the belief. And that's why there have been a number of predictions that we're likely to go back under total lockdown if we don't take it, especially because, of course, uh, the masses, the people who really need the education don't have enough education on it. And so they assume that once the lockdown has been lifted, then coronavirus is out of the system and they can go about their regular duties, even at the markets where you'd expect that they would respect social distancing. The Kumasi Central Market has had to be shut down again mm -hmm. because they did not adhere to the protocols. And so it's very disturbing, it's very worrying, especially for people who sell on the streets as well. Yeah. You barely find them wearing their mask. And, and I don't know if you've ever bought a mask, even the ones that are packaged nicely, you still have to wash it. And yesterday I came across a picture, it was a collage of uh, some people who pick the already used masks in town and then they're using brushes to Paint clean them. it. Clean it again, wash it and then resell Wait, it. Wait, where do they find the mask? I don't, you know, there was a picture as well of, you know, how it's been disposed, you know. Okay. I think there was, I, I saw a video as well in Nigeria where after they buried the chief of staff, they dis, most of them didn't want to go back, with their you know, outfits, with yeah. the PPEs and all okay. of that. So they dropped them at the cemetery and some people had to come back and disinfect the PPEs and all of that. And so it's more or less like these people are going around picking the ones people have disposed of and then trying to clean it up again and so when you're buying your mask <laughs> you have to be extremely careful you don't know where okay. it's coming from you don't know if it's been rewashed and given to you so these are some of the things we need to look at critically so that also takes us to the point where there are no masks in the system hmm hmm well we, we do understand i mean the the minister of information did say that the first batch of masks have been um given to the health workers and so we're looking forward to the next batch we were given a 10-day period um we i think we went past that this week sometime this week or so and we're expecting some 3.6 million masks to be provided we're still here we don't know what's happening so well, if they can update the 150, us on that 000 in a day we're yeah. still even wondering yeah. how many of them have been mm. produced and where it's been distributed to and all of that these details are 
quite scanty, I should say. Well, the media has been advised to only stick to the facts and not start any propaganda on TV, according to the Minister of Information as well. But we still have to ask questions. It's important. I mean, looking at the social distancing issue, I mean, how do they expect us to really uh, respect the protocol if people don't understand the educational materials in the local languages? What's happening to that? Uh, it's been a number of days since, you know, the last press briefing before yesterday's own where we were made aware that the Bureau of National Languages was going to translate, you know, the press briefings, the president's address into eight local languages. We're still here. We're not sure if that's happening yet. How long is it going to take before the masses get the information? And so, huh, these are the questions we're asking. And I was we expecting that, that at least by now we can have chi and ga. Listen, I even was if we have that at least... The at last least, time we had the Chi and Ga translation with Dr. Betha, the people, people from the northern region were saying that they don't understand it. Meaning that we have to, want... you know, go, go the full length and breadth of the country when it comes to languages. It's serious. It's but anyways, serious. let's take a look at the numbers in Africa. And later, we'll answer questions as to why Germany, um, even though they have some of the highest numbers, in fact, they're in the top five countries with the highest numbers in the world, but they still have uh, one of the lowest death rates. So what are they doing? right and what could we um, you know emulate from the German counterparts as well but African numbers let's see so Bella now in Africa we have some 25,832 confirmed cases of coronavirus our recovery cases are still going high we have over 600 recoveries in the last 24 hours I should say now our recovery uh, stands at 6,910 and then confirmed coronavirus deaths, that is 1,242. And in the last 24 hours, we've had 71 deaths as well. Now let's go and see the countries that are still recording cases. And South Africa, as always, like you, you mentioned earlier, hmm, still leading with some 3,635. Well, South Africa is the second on the list, I should say. Egypt this week topped the list with 3,659. They're still recording some cases. And talking about South Africa as well, they are still under lockdown this morning as you spoke to um, Jordan. And then it looks like they are nowhere close to lifting the lockdown anytime soon. But hopefully, let's hope that things get better. Now, talking about countries with more cases as well, Egypt has 3,659. Uh, Algeria has 2,910 cases. Algeria in the past couple of weeks has gone really, really fast. Some couple of two weeks ago, they were somewhere around 1,900. And then they've just catapulted to 2,910. Wow. And in Cameroon, they have 1,163 um, Comoros and Lesotho are still the only two countries on the African continent who have not recorded cases. And the interesting thing about Lesotho is the fact that it is very close to South Africa. And look at the number South Africa has recorded. And Lesotho has been under lockdown despite the fact that they haven't recorded any case yet. And South Africa has over 3,000 cases, yet Lesotho hasn't recorded any case. What are they doing so right? I'm still wondering. And I hope they'll be able to share what their secrets are. But I think the lockdown is really doing wonders for them still on countries with a lot of cases that is over 3,000 cases Morocco has 3,446 now coming down here looking at the um, the graph here gives you a detailed account of the countries that or the, the dates that we recorded cases right here on the continent and initially it was just 25,000 now it has been extended to 30,000 that should tell you that Africa over time is expected to hit that 30,000 mark what are we not doing right that is increasing our cases is it that the lockdown that we've implemented is not really working or people are still not adhering to most of the protocols that have been outlined so if you look at from the 17th of March all through to the 23rd of April were somewhere above the 25,000 mark, which is quite alarming. So this is coming from the AfricaArguments.com. They give you a map as well of all the different con uh, countries that have cases. You can see Ghana here. And the colors with the red and the oranges, that is the countries that have over 3,500. So it gives you a fair idea of everything that is happening on the continent. And if you want more information, that is one of the best places to check for all the updates, Bella. 
All right, definitely. And again, like I said, we'll find out why Germany, uh, even with the highest, some of the highest numbers across the world, they still have lower death rates. Of course, we understand that their healthcare system is robust, but there are a few other things that they may have done right as well. So we'll talk about that. We'll speak to Dental Martin, who, by the way, is, uh, of course, the founder of Guba Enterprise, but she's also a nurse and she's dedicated her life in the UK to also being a frontline health worker and fighting the virus. And she's championing a campaign here in Ghana to help uh, raise more awareness about the virus and fight it as well. So we'll speak to her and a few other people later. Keep watching. It's COVID-19 360. All right, welcome back. You're still watching COVID-19 360. We're streaming live on Facebook as well. Our WhatsApp number is very active. You can share your thoughts and comments with us as well. And earlier before we went on the break, this is what we're talking about. The masks that are being picked from wherever this looks like a gutter or a, a, a garbage site or something of the sort. And they are cleaning it here, put it back here, dry it, and then sell it back to you. So like it's saying here, mind where you buy your nose mask from because you don't know where it's coming from. If it is not packaged properly, if it is not put into a, a well-packaged stuff for you, I think it is not advisable to buy just any mask. And those even walking on the streets, you don't know where they made it from, how it is put together, the fabrics they're using and all of that. I think in as much as we are trying to protect ourselves, we need to be very conscious of these things as well. So share this. Uh, we're streaming live on Facebook. You can share it and let other people know about it as well. We need to protect ourselves. But in protecting ourselves, we need to be very, very conscious of the PPEs we're using to protect ourselves, Bella. Certainly, and yesterday, Dr. Bertha spoke extensively on the use of face mask. We'll see if we can put that out because it's a request that has come in. We'll see if we can put it out so that people understand how they can uh, take care of their face mask. But yesterday, uh, I mean, there was a press briefing where Noguchi Memorial Institute, the Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Information, they all came out to explain the numbers, and that's because there was some sort of confusion as to whether there were over 80,000 tests that had been done and had been put out by uh, the Ghana Health Service was an indication of individual tests done or some repetition tests as well. And they explained that all the numbers they've put out represent different individuals. And it's not about uh, the people who may have done two, three tests and all of that, because that was the indication we got earlier. And there's been some confusion about some other things as well, how the tests are done, the capacity of the Noguchi Memorial Institute and also the KCCR and other testing centers um, as well. And so we'll be speaking to someone who would later raise some of these worries if, if there should be any worry at all. And he is, uh, he specialized in infectious disease and also public health, sexual and reproductive health and rights laws, HIV and social medicine. He's Dr. Uh, Christopher Seth Apia, and he's joining us now. Hello, sir. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm good, and you? Good morning, Fine, to thank you. you. Good morning. It's a little dark where you are, but we'll, we'll still manage anyway. Um, yesterday, there yeah. was a press briefing, and I'm sure that you had time to watch it as well. And like I said, before that, there had been a lot of confusion as to the numbers being put out, the lag in putting these figures out, even on the Ghana Health Service as well. The explanation was not adequate, according to a lot of people out there as well. First of all, I want to find out from you that should we have cause to worry about the figures being put out and the belief maybe that governments may be manipulating the numbers? Yeah, let me say that. Um, good morning to your viewers. Um, I think that this whole COVID, if we're going to be able to address the critical concerns as far as flattening the curve and maintaining or, as it were, dealing with it appropriately, Data is very essential. Mm. That's the first thing that we need to acknowledge. Um, if we do not acknowledge data, the, the, the utility of data in such a situation, we would not be able to know where we have come from and where we are going. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we need to acknowledge is that data is of much essence. While acknowledging that, let us come to the very critical point of whether there is an issue of manipulation of data or other Okay. The thing is that if we are looking at the the, the, the number of texts that has been done, mm -hmm. you know, whether there's a discrete count in terms of individual cases yeah. or whether it's about the number of texts, I think 
yesterday from the onset, the information minister did say or did admit that the text that we have, that is a 68,000 plus numbers mm -hmm. that we have, is actually not discrete individuals. That he did admit. And at the so, beginning. At the beginning. But later, I, I think um, the professor from the biology, Noguchi. heading the biology yes. department yeah. of Noguchi came to throw light more, uh, more light on it. Mm -hmm. You see, we should not necessarily be worrying. But then, this is data. So if our data is being misleading, then it's, it's troubling. It's troubling because if you can only calculate the, your, cumul your cumulative incidence or your incidence on the basis of the number of discrete that you, tests that you have done. Mm -hmm. When I say discrete tests, I'm talking about unique individual tests that has been carried out. Let me do a simple analysis. If we have people about 1,030 or 1,040 thereabouts mm -hmm. who are self a mandatory quarantine, and out of this population, we'd expect that they would carry out about two tests before, yes. if they prove negative, they will be allowed to go home. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply that, that gives us about 2,030 or so, or 2,040. 2000 and, okay, 2,060 maybe. Yeah. yeah. And 60. So if you have that figure, and then you have about, let's say, 99 people um, recovering as of the time. Mm hmm now we have about 120, but then we want to use that data prior to the news, that, a news conference yesterday. So I want to use the data prior to that. That gives about 300 because these recovered cases, they would have tested positive in the first instance, mm -hmm. then two negative tests before they will be declared recovered. Yeah. So that gives us an average of about 300. If you add that, that one gives us about, say, 2,360 or so, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have about nine fatalities. Mm -hmm. So roughly, let us peg our figure around 2,400. Mm -hmm. If we peg our figure around 2,400, the implication is that these 2,400 should not be added to the 60 8,000 figure that we are talking about. Why do you say that? As, as, as marginal as it may be, when you deduct that figure, we will be getting around somewhere around um, 66,000 thereabout. And so if we get that figure 66,000 thereabout and we are computing our incidence rate, our cumulative incidence, our cumulative incidence will then jump up to around 1.7% and not the 1.52 that, that is being reported to us. Mm. Okay. So, so, so it, it's a cause for worry because the positivity rate that we have, as of yesterday, I checked the Ghana Health Service portal and it reported 1.52. Mm -hmm. So if you have discrete count, then you are going to have unique cases of about 66,000 thereabout. And that will bring our cumulative incidence or our positivity rate to Around 1.7 percent. No, but, but yesterday the professor of virology. 1.52. Okay, the professor of virology did state that the over yeah, 68,000 were all individual tests. So, so I'm I'm getting a little confused why you're saying that we should still take out a certain number from the mandatory quarantine, because from what he says, the repeat so it, it, tests are separate and that forms a separate uh figure which they have they are yet to put out and so as citizens we should take the over sixty thousand uh tests that they have given to us as individual tests but unfortunately our professor did not provide us how many of the other tests were duplicative tests yeah that he said is a different figure but yes he didn't mention it so what is the figure he didn't give us a figure. He said that's his part of, I think he mentioned that they are still accumulating that me, and so let me we'll get you, it later. Let me show you another issue that is quite worrying. Okay. Um, if you look at the president's presentation, I think he sees State of the Nation address to us. He did say that there was, or there were about 79% of the cases mm -hmm. that, as at the time, were imported. And as of the sixth address, we had about 378 confirmed cases. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So, if 79% of that case will give out about 299, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then if it were 299, you remember that around the ninth or 10th thereabouts, we had about 10 cases in Tamale. Yeah. That had not been added to threshold. Let us even keep that case, 10 case in Tamale, and not add it to rate. Mm -hmm. So we have about 299 cases. That the presence in his state of a nation uh, in his um, seat address is actually 297. Was, pardon me, so it's 297. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Come again, it's 297. Okay, yeah, so 297. So, if these numbers are imported cases as the president delivered to us, mm -hmm. if you use that number to compute the number of imported cases. This number cannot go down because these are confirmed imported cases. Yeah. Simply calculate that number as a proportion of our case or our positive cases that we have. If you are even to calculate it out of the 1,042, we will be getting around 26%. Okay. So the and figure that we have... Report, okay. So you're saying that the percentage that we have... That on the Ghana Health mm -hmm. Service page is not representative of the true picture? That is the point, because on the page now, I checked it before I, I came online now. On the page, it's telling us that 18% of the cases are people with travel histories, reported cases. Mm. But I'm saying that, as at the time that it was even the seat address that the president gave to us, there were about 297 of the cases that ha the president had told us that they were imported. Mm -hmm. And that, as a proportion of the total number of cases that we have now, whether you use the 1,154, it will give us 26%. Or whether you use the uh, 1,042, that's going to give us around 29%. So at this point, so, do, you, do you think that this is deliberate or you think it's just a mistake? It was overlooked? What do you I, think it is? I, I, I would not, I would, I would be very cautious in saying it's deliberate. Okay. But my point is that when we are dealing with the data, the ministry or the government should be able to admit that here we have gone wrong. So let us correct it. And it's not deliberate. Mm. So that we can all swim along. I, I will be the very last person to admit that the KCC, uh, KCCR and the Noguchi scientists working there are having to do something with the data. Mm -hmm. But I also be also saying that the ministry must also be candid in, in also admitting that we have gone wrong here. Other than that, it gives people the opportunity to spin around. Because if you throw very legitimate concerns, like what I have said, if we can, I think that was the second paragraph mm. in the present seat address or so, 9th April, mm. he was categorical that we had 378 cases and 79% of that cases were imported. And the president went ahead and even... Um, try to praise himself as of a sort by virtue that because the border has been closed and our airlines have been closed, that has been justified. But I'm saying that if we have 297, that, that case alone cannot go down. That case alone, that the president did say that it's a confirmed case of imported, uh, a confirmed imported case. If you calculate the percentage of that relative to how many positive cases we have had, that should not give us 18% being reported as of yesterday and as of there were a few minutes ago that I, uh, I, spoke, uh, I began speaking with you, that I checked the Ghana Health Service portal. That should give us around 26%. So, so something is not tallying up somewhere. Okay. And I think that the ministry should be candid and not rubbish everybody as trying to spin around. So that means that you're saying Ghanaians should not accept the figures. Not necessarily that, but I mean, we should look at it with a second eye and keep questioning. When it comes to epidemiological data, if the government is not willing to admit that we have been wrong here, definitely Ghanaians are going to spin around the data. Okay. Okay. So yes. Th so they should be candid and say that, okay, we have gone wrong here. We have done a reanalysis of it, that it was an error. Then we move forward. But other than that, you would expect people spinning around and raising a lot of questions about the credibility of the data, which at this moment in our, our time, we do not need that kind of narrative because it shifts focus from the actual that we are doing.
Okay, so, so when you say shift focus, do you think that if we had the real numbers and we understood it that well, we probably would take more precaution and, you know, we'll respect social distancing and people would understand how serious this is? Does it make any difference? As well, because it, in previous studies by the WHO and other independent epidemiology studies, we've seen that the incidence rate for this disease is around 1.4 to 7.0. Mm -hmm. If you look at, so if Ghana is doing 1.74, Assuming that we take these numbers from the 68,000, which uh, from your narrative, the ministry will not want to admit that. And unfortunately, it's also, no, it's also not willing to tell us how many discrete counts are available. Then people will begin to ask, 1.5 to 1.74, it doesn't make that much of a noise. But then it will tell you that, yes, the, the incidence rate or the cumulative incidence that we are picking up, it's increasing. Though it's increasing, it's not that alarming. But my okay. first one is that we are dealing with data. So the data should be as credible as, 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 as far as it is. Okay. All right. Anyway, Dr. Seth Apia, thank you so much for speaking to us. And, um, well, let, let's wait and see what explanation, moving on, government will give to us and whether there will be an admission, if any, that they may have made a mistake. But thank you again for speaking to us. And we wish you the best. He is specialized in infectious disease, public health, sexual and reproductive health and rights law, HIV and social medicine as well. Later, we'll speak to Denta Mwating, who tell us what it's like fighting as a frontline health worker in the UK in the midst of coronavirus and uh, a few others as well. And so we're still talking about the washing of, you know, um, um, te well, basically face mask and how you should be careful how you buy or where you buy it from as well. We'll be right back. Time to speak to our experts. Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist and Dr. Betha Sewa Ai is an infectious disease specialist. And since we started COVID-19 360, they've been on with us to educate the public further on how they can protect themselves and also giving us enough information about the disease as well. So today they are back again and we're going to keep talking about self-isolation, what is the right way to go about it and looking at the situation where our frontline police officers have been asked to self-quarantine whilst some tests are being conducted to ensure that none of them have caught the virus. We're asking, is it feasible looking at the living conditions of majority of these police officers? And so doctors, thank you again and good morning for joining us. Uh, good, good morning. morning. Thanks for joining good us. Good morning. <laughs> Let me come to you first, uh, Dr. Newman. Um, I do understand, of course, that as a health worker, you may have spoken to a few people about self-isolation and looking at the conditions in Ghana, First of all, do you even think that it is even possible for majority of Ghanaians to self-isolate if they should come into contact with the virus or if they should test positive? Uh, I, think, I think generally, uh, depending on your living situation, it may be difficult or not. Let me give you like three scenarios. One, there was a woman who has about three kids, lives with about five others uh, in a two-bedroom apartment you know, and mm. with a, a, a husband and a, a, I think a nephew or something, right? And, and so they, they live in that, that small space. Mm. So self-isolating, you know, in that small space was really, really difficult, you know, and yeah, she has little kids who she takes care of and she's the, she's the one who cooks in the house. So she was even struggling to know how to cook. What do I do about these, you know, these kids they will mm. be there and they will come and they want to hug her and touch her. And she doesn't have a single uh, one room she could go and self-isolate and people coming around and all that. It was difficult. Yeah. And actually, she couldn't self-isolate. She couldn't. Mm. So she was trusting that, you know, the lab results will, will come up and, and it will be negative. You know, so that, that, that is one situation. And there are a lot of people in that kind of situation. You hardly find, you know, even those middle income, high in income you know, level people may not even have that number of space to mm -hmm. be able to say that I'm going to self-isolate. Then also, there was another person to who uh, lives with their mother. You mm -hmm. know, he's, he's a young man, lives with um, uh, his mother and father. You know, and it's, I think it's about two bedroom house or so, right? And yeah. before they asked him to go uh, under some quarantine, 
he had interacted with this them for a while, you mm. know. So the fact that okay, I've been with them already. So if even if I have it, they would have gotten it anyway. So why self isolate? You know that kind of mindset. So yeah. you have people living in that kind of condition where they are even the ones taking care of their parents on a day to day basis. For example, someone lives with a parent who is unwell right in terms of mobility and all that mm -hmm. and that person is the one who is supposed to take care of that pa parent on a day-to-day -day basis you know and and because of the lockdown rules and all that people can't come from far away maybe from the village or something to come and live with them to take care of that that woman so it's difficult then yeah. also you may have some people who live alone mm -hmm. so those who live alone it may be easy and even for those who live alone they may have to make arrangements for food and all that. Yeah. If they can't stock food for a week or two, then that also becomes difficult, mm -hmm. right? But in the midst of that, you know, the psychological effect of this is huge. Mm. They may not have physical symptoms, but psychologically it's there, especially trying to wait for your results, whether it will be negative or positive. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's something else. So physically, they may not have any symptoms of a uh, cough, you know, fever and all that, you may say, okay, go. But that saying go in itself is not enough. Yeah. Medically, in terms of physical health, they may be fine. You know, no symptoms. And most of them, their problem is not even the symptoms of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But the fact that all the stigma and all yeah. the, you know, issues around the fear, anxiety, stress in going about your normal duty. And I told you, I've gone on isolation before, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that, you know, I was walked straight from work into isolation yeah. straight you know with 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 my that dress i wore to work <laughs> you know uh, you go straight and they have to bring you food and put it at the door you know and they'll they knock and they, so the person will run away you know as though <laughs> you, know, you, come and you have to come and pick the food you know it was some way it can hey, be doctor, difficult I mean. <laughs> oh it can be difficult but then uh, dr Betha, so if that's the case then what's the best way to isolate that's if you even have the means I think that um, because, you know, right now we are in a mode of enhanced testing and aggressive um, pursuit of every single case, I'm almost thinking, you know, what is coming to mind is how we treated the 1,030 travelers who came in in the third week of March. Mm -hmm. They were put in a hotel and tested, and out of that, 105 or something were posted. I'm, I'm almost thinking that, we should find a facility, whether it's a secondary school or a hotel. And any, if we get any sense of the fact that somebody cannot isolate well and will pass it on to even one person, we should spend some of the funds. We've collected $1 billion loan. Of course, I don't know what the money is being used yeah. for, but at least whatever funds we said we want to use to control this and keep them in a place. Because if even one person transmits to one person, it's not just transmission to one person. You've potentially transmitted it to 81 or 243 people because that person, one, will give to three, become nine, 27, 81, two. So my, my, I suppose what I'm saying is even one transmission can make a huge difference. So if that's where we have to put resources, it's costly, but that is the situation as it is. That's I the think thing. That it could be costly because looking at the mandatory quarantine of travelers, uh, we still don't have the figure as to how much governments may have spent uh, in keeping these people for two weeks, maybe three weeks, you know. And so if we're looking at incurring cost again, putting these number of people, and in this case, we're even talking about 8,000 or more police officers and a few other Ghanaians who may be asked to self-isolate who may not have the means as well. This means feeding them morning, afternoon, evening, uh, electricity, water, government is bearing that cost. But at the same time, you know, they are still going to feel the pinch. Right. But Bella, if you think about the fact that each person's life is worth over a billion dollars, okay? I mean, you cannot even quantify life. Take the example of the rector of our Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. Mm -hmm. I know, I don't know the identity of all those who have died, but the dagger and the pain that went through our hearts knowing what he means to the medical community and the fact that this is an irreversible loss. Whatever amount of money we will spend to save one life, I think it's, 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 it's incomparable to anything. Mm. So whatever we can do to prevent one transmission, I mean, when it's somebody's family, you can afford to say, oh, only nine dead or only 10. But when you 
crunch down to the details of who is involved. Mm -hmm. like, like in somebody I was talking to, we're talking about Egypt, when, when it, they said they should let my people go. The, the Pharaoh was hard-hearted until his firstborn son died. Immediately it hit close. He said, go, just leave Egypt, go. Mm -hmm. So every life is important to somebody. And even if it's not important to anybody, you cannot put a value or a quantity on a human life. Mm. So, I mean, I think we can count the cost all we want. But if somebody dies, you can cry for a thousand days. You cannot bring them back. Yeah. So we should put emphasis on preventing death, preventing harm, and money. You can always, Job lost all his money, but he gained it back. Yeah. So there's a time to lose money and there's a time to gain money. That's how I will put it. Okay, so let's say I live in a house with someone who has caught the virus. This person is supposed to self-isolate. What are some steps I should take to ensure that as much as I'm trying to care for this person, I'm also not infecting myself? Then I think you come close to the hospital with all the <laughs> COVID patients I have to see. I put on a mask, goggles, I check, is my nose mask okay? I'm gowning. Yesterday, I put on an overall with socks. I was looking weird in the hospital. Mm. I'm like, you know what? I am not taking any chances. So I think if, <laughs> if you're at home with such a person and you can afford it, go and get a hazmat suit mm. before you interact with the person. But anyway, to put it on a more serious note, you just have to make sure, like Dr. Newman is saying, keep a good three to six feet distance just slide the food next to them, let them pick it up, communicate with them, and, and make sure you are not inhaling the immediate, at least now we know that the virus can stay in a room for up to eight hours suspended in the air. So as much as possible, if you can, even put some cloth in front of the door to seal off the air from permeating through the rest of the house. Wow. Let them stay there, encourage them every now and then, and, and um, Keep, what, what, keep what, yourself. What if we share a bathroom? Well, what if it's a two-bedroom hmm. house, but we have to share a bathroom and a toilet and the kitchen? Okay, well, the person doesn't well, have to come to the I, kitchen, but bathroom and toilet. Well, I, those are some of the things that I feel we should communicate with the health authorities because why spend money on expensive things when you can do something to stop the simple... At this point, we want to stop transmission of every single case. Mm -hmm. So if by communicating that, look, this is my house. This is what it is. I'm sharing this. Anyway, that's even another statement. In Ghana, almost everybody shares a bathroom with somebody. So I suppose it will require a lot of, when you finish using the bathroom, make sure you use Clorox or what, Dettol or whatever to clean the bathroom well mm. and open the windows to allow some air to go through before the next person comes to use it. Because... I mean, frankly, um, the risk is real. And if, if, as, if as a nation, we have to think through it and make sure that anybody who is infected is going to a particular facility. That's why I'm excited about the infectious disease hospitals that um, yeah. Dr. Nsiasa is we are building. Okay. That, that will be the value of these things. Well, you did mention that the virus can stay in the atmosphere for about eight hours, suspended. So that means that if... Is that what you said? That's what you said, right? That, that was in, in a very, they, it was a controlled setting, meaning they purposefully aerosolized it. You know, they did a procedure that would yeah. create a lot of water droplets. Mm. It's not your usual talking, but they, they artificially created the environment. And when they tested eight hours later, it was still in the air in that room. It doesn't mean it's airborne or it traveled very fast. Okay. Okay. But I'm saying that some of these um, studies will give you some idea of, what to do. We are still learning about the virus, but as you learn new knowledge, you put it in your pocket and then try and change your behavior to suit, you know, to suit the, 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 the learning. Because even in our care of COVID patients, after seeing a few of them, if you are not sick, you can start getting unnecessarily bold and getting close to their room. And then you have to remind yourself that, look, this patient has a virus I don't want to get. Okay, you know, so, so, um, so, so quick one, does it mean that quickly, if I use the bathroom or if someone uses the bathroom and they're infected, I have to wait a number of hours, is that something I can spray that can get rid of the virus? I mean, if we can use sanitizer on our hands, can we spray alcohol in the room, would it 
you know, kill the virus. I, and I don't that. think alcohol in the air would make a difference, but definitely wiping the toilet seats um, and the sink will reduce the contact. At least. Or preferably, if you have more than one bathroom in the house, you can decide that that particular bathroom is going to be for that person. He should use it till the infection is over, while everybody else uses um, What I'm asking is, you know the droplets that stay in the air? So let's just say that the person just finished bathing and I walk in. There's a likelihood that I could, um, you know, catch it as well. Now, should I start going to my bathroom with my nose mask? Um, you can. I think that would be a good idea, but I don't know of any chemical that would destroy the droplets in the air. Wow. But it would be a good idea. Dr. Nima. I mean, even everybody <laughs> wearing a mask in that house will not be a stretch. Okay. Dr. Nima, you are nodding as well. Tell me why. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I was thinking that to, to re reduce the, the risk of inhaling those agents. I think that the uh, face marks will be, will be fine, especially the ones, the N95s and, and, and stuff. Even when the I'm bathing. may not be. Uh, it's, you, are, you are taking care of someone who has COVID-19, so you may have to be uncomfortable a bit. Okay. I, I don't think it's... It, it's it. Now, now, okay, you are scaring much. me because... Because for that, you know, I think that, that, that would help. Okay, so some of us stay in the studio in enclosed areas for a number of hours, constantly talking, interacting, we're here with the sound men, the technical crew, camera. So does it mean we're also at a higher risk if we're all in yeah, an enclosed uh, area? And what yeah, do we do? Because so, so everybody... Every, exactly. Um, but then if I'm coming on air and I'm speaking, I, I can't now. constantly wear a nose mask because, you know, my speech may not be audible. So how, what do I do? Uh, well, around this time, I think all of us have to be uncomfortable with 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 a, with a face mask because it's it's, it's going to help. It's, it's going to help. <laughs> I see. Anyway, let's talk about social. Okay, Dr. Betha, you wanted to speak on that. Well, I was going to say that. I mean, three three TV, uh, not anchors, but media people at CNN, um, Chris Cuomo. I forget her first name. Something Baldwin mm. and um, another gentleman. Um, a British accented CNN, I've forgotten his name, but they've all tested positive and have been ill. So you wonder, is it the constant interaction? I'm not saying you have a high risk job right now, but I'm just <laughs> saying that even in the studio, you yeah. are going to have, because you honestly, I mean, people go home and it's, it's not their fault. They mm -hmm. may pick a taxi to come to work. They've sat with somebody who has it. You don't know. So even you have to be careful. And I see you practice very good social distancing. You're all about Eight, six to eight feet from each other. So we that's try. Good. We try. I think it was Richard Quest also that was confirmed as of yesterday. Yeah, apparently. that was yeah, Richard Quest. That's what okay. I was trying to say. Okay. Okay. Talking about social distancing. Now, we all can see how difficult it is to practice that in our markets and some of the most crowded areas as well. This morning, there was um, a market woman who said, Oh, Nasa virus near Ko, into me here a face mask. Dr. Newman. Please speak to us because I, I was worried when I heard her say that. And we all suspected that it could be because the president lifted the lockdown and so indirectly is communicating that the virus is gone. Yeah, I, I, well, I think, I think that that is exactly the reason. Because, you know, when we started having some numbers, we said because of those numbers, we, we are locking down. Now, the president, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, says that we can now lift the lockdown. So those who don't understand what is going on, it may be a sign that things are clear now, things are fine now, so we can go back to our normal lives. You know, so I think all those measures, if not communicated properly, if the education doesn't go down properly, people may misinterpret the president's decisions as, uh, you know, a go ahead to do whatever they want to do. Because the while I was coming from, uh, through town, I realized everything is, is really back to normal. Mm. You will see only a few people with face masks. And, and I'm sure people are not even washing their hands, you know, again, because they feel that the risk has gone down because now we have more cases, but lockdown has been lifted. Yeah. So they feel that, okay, now everything is under control because they don't understand the president's actions and what, whatever has gone on. And we assume that everybody watches TV and listens to the radio. That, that is the problem. That, that is the assumption. We assume that everybody is watching uh, uh, TV, everybody is listening to the radio. And most, most of the people may not even listen to the president directly. They may, all, they may listen to commentaries from their friends and all the news going on. 
So I think that's where the problem is. Hmm. This, this is scary then. Dr. Betha, yeah. now another question that came in was the use of money, hard cash. Because uh, we know that any surface you touch could transmit it as well. This person wanted to understand. In this case where the lockdown has been lifted, I can go out, buy. A lot of people are back to using hard cash again. Now in this case, what do I do? How do I sanitize the, the cash I have on me uh, in order not to hand it over to someone and probably infect the person? Well, um, I think it will be very difficult to do. Um, we're used to handling money all the time, so that would be difficult. But in my mind, that is just like taking a, just a small slice of the pie when it comes to contact and exposure. Um, and just to talk about the question you posed to Dr. Newman. Yeah. I think that we have to look at um, changing us. The social distancing is a new behavior. And mm. there are two ways of people um, approaching how they change their behavior. Either you are extrinsically motivating them or there's intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic means the lockdown. I'm forcing you to stay at home and I put a soldier outside your door. So you have to keep the distance. Intrinsic means I understand why I need to keep a distance. And so I'm going to keep a distance. I don't need an external force to tell me to keep a distance. And so this is why our, our messaging has to go to a different level. We, this is where it, um, it's not just our local data. This is where we have to do a cultural adaptation. Dr. Newman was mentioning that not everybody listens to the radio um, TV or even takes a newspaper. This mm. is the time in the in Ghana, you see your body rule, you go to villages, you know how in the past they used to go to villages with a, with a, um, and, and go and tell go villages, go maybe, yeah, yeah. The, the, king, the, the, the chief wants all of you to gather at 8 o'clock so people will hear it in their windows while they are sleeping that, hey, there's a town hall meeting with, we need to go into the markets, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, they need to find people, all those people who used to preach with their loud um, speakers and we don't know what they are saying, that we need to turn them into mess people who are telling the market women there's a disease in town in different languages. Like we have to change our strategy because clearly what you said, the woman said, mm -hmm. it means two things. The signal that was sent with the removing of the lockdown has, has, has had an unintended consequence and two, our message has not penetrated at all. You know, we talk about cell phone penetration. Our message penetration is very, very shallow. Mm. We have to change. It's like driving and changing gears from gear one to gear two. We have to shift gears completely. That clearly what we've done, it hasn't reached the masses. What have we have to re-strategize completely. Um, mm. They rule chiefs. And uh, we've talked about mobilizing the chiefs. Have we actually done it? Have the chiefs had some sort of phone conference to get to the smallest town? Within the next week, we have to target. Every small town chief needs to have a way of reaching their township. I mean, the messaging, if we are taking lockdown down, the messaging has to change and change it from extrinsic motivation of um, social distancing to an intrinsic motivation. Yeah. You know, and just to give an example, I call my mother and the messaging she's giving me, I mm. hear, say, Mama, what's your dear nasty pa? I say, me tie, me tie mm. we, we want even an 80-year-old woman to be able to verbalize that, look, I have to keep my distance. Yeah. Then we are getting the message across. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, Dr. Newman, any last words before we wrap up on this segment? Uh, well, I, I would say that as a nation, uh, today I was quite, quite happy that uh, though people are still in town and all that, you realize that uh, the lockdown, now we know that people really stayed home. Because when they were home, we didn't know until they came back to town. So now I can see a big difference in terms of people uh, uh, listening to what the president says. You know, people were listening. Mm. So what it means is that whatever they say, people are likely to listen. Because yeah. now you see there's a big difference between last week and this week, when you go to town, mm -hmm. it means that generally we are we are law abiding in some sense. Yeah. You know, we may have practical challenges that prevent us from doing what we are supposed to do. So I, I was quite happy as a nation that we've moved on, you know, from from a certain kind of attitude 
What it means is that if the president keeps doing what he's doing, right, keeps giving us direction, keep talking to us, maybe instead of coming once a week, he can decide to take one of the days of the week off mm. and come and not talk about that way forward, but to add some form of education to the public. Yeah. I'm sure people will listen to the president. Okay. If they know that every Wednesday, maybe in the evening, the president is coming from 7 to 8 to just to talk about coronavirus, not to way forward, but to educate us. I'm think, I think it's going to draw a lot of people's attention because we are listening to him. Mm. And I'm happy for what has happened so far just that the education should continue because Definitely. we are listening to our president. Very valid point. Dr. Beth, a quick one. I must say that, okay. I must say that the, the president and his administration have demonstrated, on rem, I mean, remarkable yeah. leadership. Yeah. I mean, I don't know of any country that has had six um, press conferences. The president yeah. is showing his face. He's paying for water, electricity, taking the message to the people. I mean, they've done above and beyond. And we have to give credit where well, credit, credit is due, due and yeah. acknowledge the, the, the efforts and time yeah. he's put into this. And Absolutely. it is the same love and attention that may have made him decide, you know what, let me just leave the lockdown and for, allow for the people. people. I don't, but I'm just saying that um, kudos to the administration for the, the work they okay. put into um, COVID-19. All right, Dr. Bertha, this is just a 30-second question. Quick one. So we came across a photo where people were washing the N95 masks, drying them, and selling mm. them again. Are they reusable? Yes. Um, I, it's not washing, but um, a lot of hospitals are recycling them up to four times. Some are using UV lights. Um, I haven't read the details of everything, but okay. um, the world has N95 masks. We used to use about 15 a day for one patient per person. So if six people go and see the patient that day, that's 90 masks on one. And today we are reusing them. And it's not just N95. In some hospitals, the nurses surgical. are changing okay. using the same PPE. I mean, so yes. N95s are recyclable for up to four times. And, and even the surgical mask as well. But what if this is someone who's just washing on the street and selling back to us on the that, road? That, that, that's illegal and immoral. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, doctors, for speaking to us. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai, yes. infect, uh, infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist. Anita has some messages for us. Sure. Thank um, you so, so much this for one. All right. <laughs> this was a good morning, Bella and Anita. I would advise we spend more time to educate the citizens on what is to be done to prevent themselves from getting the virus. Stress more on the protocols or guidelines to stay safe. On the data, you can't solve that in your studio. What you can do is send someone to Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service to audit or understand how they come about the data. And with Lesotho, let's find out the number of testing they've done to be having such results of less positive cases. Well, they don't have any case, by the way. Keep on doing the great work. Thank you so much. Hi, Bella and Anita. I think there's been an improvement in the recoveries. May God wipe away this deadly disease and may God prevent each and every individual from this virus. Ramadan Karim to all Muslims in a motherland. Yes, this is coming from Prince Edi in Tamale. Bella, I'm not getting something clear. Why did the National Health Insurance Authority donate 250,000 cities to the COVID-19 fund? Is it look face or what? I believe they have finished payment of their backlog funds to the facilities they owe. Wonder shall never end. This is from Enoch Da Costa from Asesawa. Hello, Bella and Anita. You are doing a great work as far as updates on coronavirus pandemic is concerned. Keep it up. This is uh, from Fred in La. All right. So we're taking more of your messages shortly when we come back from the break. This is still COVID-19 360. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right, you're welcome back. It's the COVID-19 360. Just a few minutes before we wrap up, and we're crossing over to the UK, where they have recorded 133,495 cases with a little over 18,000 deaths. And we're speaking to Denta Amwating, who's the founder of Guba, proudly Ghanaian, um, and also she is a nurse in the UK and also a frontline health worker. Good morning, sis. Thank you Good for joining morning. us. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be to be alive. You know, uh, because there's been so many uh, recent um, people that I know, um, people that are you know an extended family that I know that have got the coronavirus, mm -hmm. um, and you know we even heard about the story of the young Ghanaian girl who was pregnant, had the baby. Yeah. 
um, and also died. So it's it's very it's a very tough time mm-hmm. um, for all of us. Um, and so for us to be here speaking this morning is a blessing. So Definitely. we thank God for that. Now it's even tougher being a frontline health worker. I know you're a nurse, and so you also um, have dedicated your time to helping fight the virus in the UK. Yeah. How how bad is it? It is bad. Um, you know, the amount of deaths that's happening in the UK, we're looking at between 800 to 900 deaths a day. 800 to 900 deaths a day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so for me, I'm a pediatric nurse. So mm-hmm. what's happened now with um, children's nursing is that they've had to close a lot of our our wards Mm -hmm. because one a lot of um parents are not bringing their children into hospitals Mm -hmm. and so even our ward um in london has been closed down and has been turned into a covid19 um ward Mm. so what's happened to some of the pediatric nurses is that we are now moved to do adult nursing um some feel very uncomfortable about that because it's not something that we have studied um and it's not something that it's some of some people's passion, you know, their passion is for children's nursing. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult time um, for everyone. Um, You know, there's, you know, lack of PPEs in the hospitals. Um, um, For the demand, you know, we've, you know, one of the hospitals, I think Watford or Luton, they've had to close because there's no oxygen. Mm. Uh, So it's, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy time at the moment. As a nurse, what's it like coming into contact, close contact with someone who's tested positive, who's battling the virus in the hospital? Um, is, is it scary? Uh, I mean, you're talking about lack of PPEs and stuff, but just looking at the person and how they're grappling with the disease, what goes through your mind? Um, one, your, your emotions are with the person um, that... You know, they've got this COVID-19 um, and two, you're scared that, God, you just think, I don't want to be in that position. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to be where this person is because it's real. It yeah. is so real. The pain that they go through, you know, the respiratory stuff that they go through. And it's just you're you're scared and you're scared that you're going to come home and you're going to pass it on to your children and your yeah. family. Um, but one thing that I do want to stress this is Ghana we see a lot of nurses in their uniforms outside. Mm-hmm. Please, Ghanaian nurses, when you go, when you're going to work, don't put your uniform on because whatever trotro or taxi that you take, whatever's in there, one, you take it to work. Mm-hmm. Two, when you finish work, remove your uniform because that is a spread of infection. Mm. Okay. I don't know what you can see. I see a lot of nurses in Ghana, you know, the green uniform. Yeah, yeah. And it's not right. You're not supposed to be going out with your uniform. Because you are indirectly spreading the yes. virus. You're indirectly spreading the virus. It's so, it's so important. Like, us nurses here, you, 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 you don't wear your uniform to work. You wear it when you get to work. Okay. When you finish work, you take it off. Put it in a plastic bag and then come home and wash it. At this time, you need to be washing your uniform on a daily basis. No, but, but I mean, if you're in the hospital and you're wearing the overalls and everything, isn't your uniform protected from it because the virus only comes into contact with the overalls? No. So, look, anything can happen. And it's not about, it's about taking precaution. Mm. You don't know. You Sometimes, you know, we are walking, walking, um, maybe from the drug room. You don't know what can contaminate your, your, your trousers or walking through a, the patient or the curtains. Mm-hmm. You know, there's different, different things that could happen. And so for you to be 100% sure, it's best that when you use a uniform, you, you take it take off. Take it away and you, yeah. you wash it and you wear a new one. How do you manage coming back home to your family after being in the hospital for a number of hours? What what is your precautionary measure like the moment you get home? Um, definitely wash your hands. Obviously, my uniform goes straight into um, the washing machine. Mm. Um, I I it's hard to social distance from your from your children. Yeah. Um, but you know, we try to you know kind of have that distance for a couple of hours. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, you do, all you can do is just wash your hands regularly um, and just try your best not to be so affectionate mm-hmm. with the children. 
um, as much as possible. Um, and the kids also, they know that they've got to wash their hands yeah. um, and, you know, do everything that they have to do. But it's it's a, it's a difficult thing when you've got children at home that are young and... Okay. Looking at the fight in the UK as against the fight here in Ghana against the virus, what are some of the things you think that we could adopt, especially because I know that you are running the Stop COVID-19 campaign with a, a lot of other personalities as well. What are some of the things you've identified that you think we can fix here in Ghana? Um, so I think that um, obviously we've started the campaign to rock your mask, which I think is an, is an important thing. Look, the UK and Ghana is... The, the, the issues are, are, are a bit different. You know, in Ghana, we've seen that, you know, there's a lot of people that feed um, this hand to mouth, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to do more of the social distancing campaign, more of wearing a mask and more of the washing the hands. Okay. You know, I've watched a couple of um, videos and people still don't understand why they should be washing their hands. People are just talking about they're drinking the alcohol. It, like the education mm. doesn't seem to be sinking in. So I think a lot of the community people that are in these communities, we need to champion somebody. Yeah. Somebody to be respect in the community to champion the awareness mm. so that people understand the <laughs> what happens to you when you get the coronavirus. Mm. And you know, you don't want to get it. Definitely. Um, and so I think more education needs to be done um, in that um, respect. And I think, you know, even in the UK, we're finding that people are still going out, um, even though you think that, you know, they they kind of know um, they've got a good education background, but people are still going out. When the sun comes out, people are out. Mm. Um, and people apparently went to the beaches in the UK as well and beaches in Ghana that we yeah. saw. And so um, I think the education needs to be more. I think Definitely. With, with, with the UK, at least we, we see every day the, the deaths that are happening i think ghana because the deaths are low you know only 10 or whatever mm. it is people are not feeling it people are not seeing it i think and even i heard uh, one of the interviews as well was like we're not seeing what's what's happening you yeah. know yeah um and so they're not they're not feeling it as much as we are feeling it here okay anyway then thank you so much for speaking to us and we wish you well please stay thank safe you. for us and protect your family as well Thank you so much. But lastly, Bella, I think it's so important that now we are seeing a lot of innovation coming from our motherland. Mm. Um, we're seeing people doing PPEs, people doing masks, and I think that we need to champion and promote that. This is a time that manufacturing in our country needs to be boosted and picked up and supported. Definitely. So I think that's one thing that we need to we need to try and do. Definitely. Thank you so much, Denta Martin, MBE. Mm. She's a founder of Guba and also a frontline worker. Over to Anita. Yes. Messages before we go, and this one is quite critical. It says, Please, I'm not comfortable in my area because of the COVID 19 patients in my house and my area. Please, I'm in that problem. The patient is living in a single room with his wife and three children. So, right after the show, we'll take your details and then get in touch with you. This is very important. Another one says, Good morning, Anita and Bella. Please, I want to ask that are the people who have recovered and then the death toll we've had as well added to the positive people because the cases are going high? Yes. Everything sums up to the total number of cases we have. That is 1,154. This one says, what saddens my heart is when the data was still defended yesterday, the right thing must be done because the people of Ghana deserve to know the right information, just as it is wrong to spread false information. Hmm. Anyway, well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, our time is up. We have to go. But we'll be back tomorrow to wrap up the week. My name is Berlamundi. And my name is Anita Ikuyo Have a good morning.